Hello, my name is Neil Cannon. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of LED Dynamics. Today we're here to talk about a very important topic, how lighting affects our sleep and health. Normally, human beings are, let's say, outside a fair bit, but this is over time not really progressed. In fact, it probably is going the other way. Most of the human activity takes place indoors, as much as 80%. But had we been out in the sunlight, we would have been continuously exposed to a changing light source. The sun is the perfect light for humans. It's, it's what we evolved under. It has a somewhat amber tone in the morning and in the evening. And in the middle of the day, it is, it is a more blue form of light. And that, as we'll show, triggers our circadian entrainment and triggers our ability to function throughout the day. Normally, a, a human being is going to wake up at about 7.30 in the morning, and that will be when melatonin secretion stops. And then they'll have maximum alertness, they'll go through the middle of the day, and then finally at about 9 p.m., melatonin starts to be initiated, and then you've got the somnolence of having the, uh, the melatonin circulating in your body, which actually is what makes you sleep. Melatonin is sort of the control of our sleep-wake cycle. And light's effect on humans has been studied. Indeed, we've got a lot of things that are relatively easily measured that are reasonably well understood. We can take immediate measurements of visibility, of color, of glare, of contrast. These things are uh, pretty well understood and we see how humans react to that. Even we can understand what was on the previous slide, melatonin suppression and alertness over an hourly basis. We can take samples and understand how people are reacting with that. Even over days, we can get a sense of their circadian entrainment, which then affects a large number of other kinds of human activity, even up to and including people who are not well circadian entrained and having problems with sleep, show a higher tendency to be in an accident. And then if you look over years, there's things that happen annually, like seasonal affected disorder and various other types of disorders that are now beginning to be provably linked to disruptions in circadian entrainment and circadian rhythms. These middle time frames are a little bit more difficult to show because you have to do longer studies. They're not something you can just put a meter under and measure. And the hardest, of course, is to explore through correlations what effects that this sleep-induced ramifications have on us over a much longer time frame. And first amongst these is really dementia. And we'll discuss a little bit more about how that works today. But these, of course, have to be conducted on rather lengthy study bases because the effects on humans are rather slow and subtle and have to be observed over time. You can think of the, the human eye as actually our fastest sense capability. It's the raw bandwidth of the human eye is quite high. If you think of it like a computer scientist, it's, uh, it's actually quite impressive. The other senses we have make us aware of what's going on at, at a less frequent basis and a little bit more slowly. You know, that being said, there is a remarkable discovery in the process of the eye, which is the rods and the cones are actually there for this very fast visual awareness that we create. And that communicates with what's known as our visual cortex. But there's a second set of receptors that have only been discovered over the last couple of decades, which are called the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And why these are so important, they sit in a different location and they create something called melanopsin. And you see the graph here on the bottom of the page. It shows you where in the spectral space, where in the, the pattern of the way light is presenting uh, in it, terms of its color, where that shows up. It's about 480 nanometers, which is a very selective part of the light spectrum. And there are reasons why we have to consider that that's the case. But the, the other parts of the eye operate on a much faster basis and at different parts of the spectrum. The eye has a second pathway into the brain, not just to the visual cortex, not just to give us perception, give us spatial awareness. It also, because of this intrinsically photosensitive ret retinal ganglion cell, it gives us our clocking. It basically, the, the way it works is the retinal ganglion cell is somewhat of an accumulator. So the amount of light you're exposed to, how bright it is, and the spectral content will all conspire to give you either a somnolent state or a wakeful state based on what you're seeing in your eye. Your, your, this part of your eye does not communicate with the uh, uh, visual cortex. Rather, it communicates with something called the superchiasmatic nucleus. And the reason that's such an important feature of our brains is it directly communicates with the pineal gland where melatonin is produced. So what happens when you make melatonin? Uh, basically, you go through a day and you rather 
slowly increase your melatonin production in the evening. It peaks in the middle of the night, and then as you wake up in the morning, it tends to drop rather quickly. And during the day, you have very, very low levels of melatonin circulating in your body. And this is maximal awakeness. And of course, the deepest of sleep is when the melatonin is most prevalent in our bloodstream. But there is a problem here. Uh, melatonin as a substance in us, it declines with age. It peaks in early childhood. Um, newborns actually have very little melatonin, which is why they're <laughs> waking up quite frequently for young parents. But as we get through, let's say, the, the teenage years and the 20s, we start to see these declines in the melatonin. Um, and there are reasons for that. The eye itself changes over time. The suprachiasmatic nucleus changes over time, and unfortunately, the pineal gland also undergoes calcification. So older individuals actually produce very, very low levels of melatonin, which makes it difficult to sleep with these kind of low levels. It's not that people of greater ages are unable to sleep, but they're achieving that sleep typically with lower levels of melatonin. And this become a problem of greater import because actually the, the average age of people is growing. Year over year, continent over continent, we see the age of populations growing older and older. So this is an extrapolation done as to what's going to happen over time. As you can see that virtually every population in the, in the world is undergoing an aging effect. What is the risk of actually having poor sleep? As we've said here that it's clear that um, uh, human beings don't do as well as they age with their sleep. But what, what does it mean to not have good sleep? The risk of poor sleep uh, was actually made more clear by a discovery in 2012. The uh, group studying in Rochester figured out something called the glymphatic system. And why is this so important? Well, the human body has a way of clearing its metabolites called its lymphatic system. And this is pervasive in the body but it is not present in the brain. So the brain has a very large number of neurons, but it does a lot of our work, <laughs> mental work, uh, using a lot of our own energy. About 25% of our energy is actually consumed in the brain, even though it's only 2% of body mass. The glymphatic system is a very elegant way of clearing metabolites, but it works during deep sleep, meaning that if you don't get to deep sleep, your brain can have uh, issues with being able to clear those metabolites. And how does this work in detail? It turns out there's this glymphatic system, which is relatively recently discovered, operates in a manner that is much more effective during uh, the sleep state because a, a chemical called norepinephrine is down-regulated during this particular part of sleep, and that allows fluid flow to be increased during the sleep in the brain. When you wake up, norepinephrine then becomes upregulated and the fluid flow actually slows down. So we sort of have a little bit of a plumbing problem during the day. We can't clear our own brains, but as it works out, we can do so by achieving deep sleep. And this looks a little bit sort of a cartoon here, but it, it looks a little bit like this. The arterial blood flow is actually uh, coming up into the brain and pushing cerebral spinal fluid across to the venous side continuously. And the reason this works so much better during deep sleep is because with the downregulation of, of norepinephrine, there is actually more space in our brains. It increases the interstitial spaces, and this allows these metabolites to move much more quickly over to the uh, venous side and be cleared out of the brain up to 60 times faster than during wakeful um, periods. And, and this is quite important. So we now know that the human brain needs deep sleep in order to clear its metabolites, and there's a very well understood, uh, increasingly being investigated for all of its ramifications, a physiological understanding now of the human brain's ability to clear itself of these waste products. And now let's talk a little bit about light. Why are some sources of light going to be more like sunlight? Why are other sources of light going to be less like sunlight? And what would those effects be on a human being? Visible light is typically characterized much the way the sun has been characterized. The sun is what's known as a black body, meaning it emits via thermal radiation, which you can also achieve by heating up metal, or as is in an incandescent bulb, you can create a, a small piece of metal that's at a very high temperature and then it will glow. And on the scale on the right here, uh, the coolest color temperature, the 10,000 Kelvin, it looks cool like as in blue, is actually the highest heating. And the cooler is what we think of as warmer light. So it's a little bit inverted. 
But basically, if you can think about it, as we heat up a piece of metal, it goes from being rather amber all the way up to blue. And the sun behaves the same way. It's a black body radiator. And uh, all of these sources were essentially how light was created, thermal radiation, up until very recently. Uh, why is this important? There is a, a study where we map out where the colors are coming out of light, and we then can observe what is known as the black body curve or locus. It's an individual curve through the color diagram that shows us where the combination of all the colors makes white light. And it makes white light all the way up to as far as 10,000 Kelvin or maybe even beyond and all the way down to very warm color temperatures, warm as in perceived warmth, uh, like 1500 Kelvin, much like candlelight versus noontime lighting. And here's a little bit more explanation as to what sun is doing during the day, because the sun does vary as we observe it. But at the very top of the atmosphere, which you can see by <laughs> Elon Musk's car rotating around the planet, the illumination is quite constant. The sunlight that's out there is actually about 5,800 Kelvin. It's a black body spectrum. But the radiation at sea level has been filtered by the atmosphere and attenuated slightly. There's some things that are in the atmosphere that take away from the light we perceive. But this is what gives us our beautiful sunsets. Because the light passes through the atmosphere at different distances, we see a little bit different uh, color of light during the day, and I'll show you how that works. Uh, so if, you're, if your light rays are coming into uh, through a long distance through the atmosphere, they will be more heavily scattered, and specifically more of the blue light will be removed, and that's because of something called Rayleigh scattering, which you talk about. But the short distance, which is essentially the equator at noontime, that is a very small amount of change in the lighting. So you get very, very much the light that arrived at the top of the atmosphere with only a small deviation as you come to the surface of the planet. At noontime, you don't see these quite amber forms of sunlight. At evening and in morning, you do. And it very high on the globe, of course, this is exaggerated. The dominant physics about this was discovered by Lord Rayleigh, and he realized that the type of chemical composition of the atmosphere caused it to preferentially scatter the blue light more than the red or amber light. In fact, it's a continuum, but uh, in short, when we have a long distance to travel through the atmosphere, we lose a lot of blue light. So the morning light or the evening light is quite amber, whereas during the middle of the day, much of this Rayleigh scattering does not influence the light, and it reaches the surface of the planet in such a way that the blue light is more present. So the actual spectral composition of light changes throughout the day. And that's what human beings are used to seeing. Just as we understood that the superchiasmatic nucleus, the retinal ganglion cells, and that whole system that addresses your pineal gland is sensitive in the blue, we also note that blue is the most changed part of the light that we receive from the sun through the Earth's atmosphere, which has the real effect of influencing our physiology and keeping us either awake, alert, <laughs> or allowing us to go to sleep. So what should we be seeing? At noontime, this is a representation of uh, what the spectra of light should look like. It's actually got a lot of blue, but it also has an even distribution of the other colors. Then in evening, we'll see that blue light being pushed down in the spectra. So the content here of the blue in the middle diagram is heavily suppressed, and you see the, the amber sunset, which is quite a lot of red and yellow, coming through the atmosphere towards your eyes. And then very much on the other end is finally when human beings came up with fire and candles and so on, we were able to make sources of light that were based on a very small amount of material burning, and that had almost no blue light. So these types of lights did not keep us awake. A candle is a very good way of making sure you don't have too much blue light in the uh, late evening hours or a fire. So can we actually simulate sunlight indoors? Because that's really what's probably needed here. We need to get away from using simple types of lighting, and we need to move towards types of lighting that look and act much more as the sun behaves as it's filtered by the atmosphere and reaching human beings, even while they're indoors, to keep their circadian entrainment as well kept up as, as we can foresee. Um, there's several things we have to take into account. One is we need color accuracy. We can't have the light looking wrong. It has to be quite close to what the black body locus does. So color correction is a part of this. The color rendering of light too, which is a little different from color accuracy, but the color rendering is how exactly we get 
the colors that we observe with our eyes. We want that to be full spectrum. It requires a certain amount of optical innovation to get that working. Um, and then finally, the intensity and the angle of light have to be considered because outdoor lighting is quite intense and it has different angles of delivery as you observe it throughout the day. It's low in the horizon at the morning and then ramps up uh, over the day and uh, until it's directly overhead. So all of these factors have to be considered. And of course, you know, you're going to have to account for where you are on the planet uh, when you set up any one of these systems because the sun is not observed in the same space depending on where you are. So here are the maybe some of the tools that we could do this with. Um, on the far right is an incandescent bulb, which is not too far from a, a candle <laughs> in terms of having low blue and more in the amber. But there aren't too many ways to control that such that it changes throughout the day and this, there's not a, the same flexibility certain other types of light generation can achieve. So for instance, fluorescent lighting is actually constructed using a mercury plasma which means that what's in those tubes is a small amount of mercury vapor. And then you get a phosphor on the outside of that, which converts UV light, which is what a mercury plasma creates, via phosphor to give you visible light. And that's quite a different spectra. It was thought of as the um, uh, more mature and also efficient version of lighting that substantially displaced a lot of incandescent. And then on the very far left here, we have LEDs. The LEDs have a very different construction. They're a semiconductor way of generating light. So the electrical current is introduced into a chip. And then that chip via phosphor is given a broader spectrum. So what you see in the spectra on the LED side is a very pronounced blue spike followed by a phosphor converted as you move to the longer wavelengths and the warmer color temperatures um, <clears throat> version of the output. So, so LEDs uh, hold high promise in this area because they are a little bit more changeable by their phosphors and also by their intrinsic chip pumps. The blue pumps are referred to as a pump because they pump the phosphor and, and give shorter wavelength uh, illuminance. So these, these are probably where it's gonna go. Some kinds of strategies have certainly have been pursued with older technologies, but much of lighting now is done exclusively with LEDs. And um, this is where we felt it was important to innovate using those. So uh, the observer may have seen something called night shift on their iPads and on their phones and so forth. When you measure this, it indeed reflects the LEDs that underlie the uh, tablets and the mobile devices we use. Very, very high blue peaks in normal setting. Fortunately, it does uh, drop down as you use the night shift function and it becomes quite a bit more amber. And uh, it's probably not a bad idea to use night shift on your mobile devices, especially if you like to use them uh, late at night when you should be becoming sleepy. Use the night shift and that's probably better. But it is still not exactly mimicking what sunlight is doing. It's a two-step process usually. Part of the day is, is given to you in normal mode and part of the day is given to you in night shift mode, but you can adjust that. This is somewhat of a first innovation to try and help people better manage their sleep profile. We've come up with a very different way of doing correction. We've dubbed this uh, innovation perfect light. We made it with a K, which is perhaps a little bit of a scientific joke as Kelvin is with K. But we realized that we could meet all the criteria of simulating sunlight inside by adding one extra chip. Uh, that extra chip is shown here in this diagram to the right as a green chip. So we have a, a warm source and a cool source. So we can do each of the ends of the spectra. Uh, we can make very, very cool light as you would have at noontime and very, very warm light at uh, evening or, or morning hours. Uh, with a system like this, the spectral power distribution can change throughout the day and it can imitate sunlight. The green chip is crucial because it eliminates something called a hue error. And the other thing that's achieved with this corrected system is we can produce lighting systems that give us a very wide range of what is known as correlated color temperatures, CCTs, all the way down to 2000, all the way up to 6500. So very much candlelight to noontime. Exactly those parameters is what we set out as a design goal. Luckily, we also discovered that doing correction in this way gave us very exceptional color rendering as well as uh, very, very high values for the color rendering indices. So it looked like to us when we started this kind of work that we had something that was uh, genuinely helpful to circadian entrainment, as well as doing a great job at simulating sunlight inside. What does it look like in detail? 
if you mapped out how we produce light with imperfect light how, and how the color varies across the day, you would see a sunrise that has a very low blue peak and a lot of amber. Throughout the day, it would grow in blue till nude time, just as the sun does. And then as it becomes night, we see this uh, fading back away and we have pretty much the same spot we had at the sunrise at the sunset, which is exactly how the sun behaves. What is this obscure form of art, the uh, hue error? Well, it turns out, and this is a picture out of an instrument that measure these, these sort of things, so that black line tracing through that is the black body locus. That's the actual trace through the color diagram that gives us the black body locus. Around that are the boxes of acceptability of being close enough to that black body curve to observe no obvious called hue errors, usually pinkish errors on this side of the graph. But the blue line is the crucial issue here. The blue line with the two dots at either end is just taking two light sources, one warm and one cool, and attempting to combine them in such a way that we get all the intermediate CCTs, all the intermediate colors of light have to be produced. But what we find is that lies on a straight line. It doesn't follow the curve. So we have these few errors. In fact, uh, as you can see from this diagram, there is a series of CCTs in the middle, which is a big preponderance of the day, where we're outside the, uh, the boxes of acceptability. And uh, we need to do something here. So what are we fixing? So that little delta right there from where we want to be to where we are is called the hue error. We want to drive that as close to zero as we can. So this is how we do it. We add this green correction. And with that green correction added, you see the green trace that now very exactly overlays the black trace. So there's very, very little Q error. I mean, less than can be discerned with modern instruments. Fidelity is also improved and it brings basically all the points onto the black body curve, corrects the hue errors across this very large range of CCT. So when we figured this out, we thought, hmm, this has got it. You know, this is as close as we can get interior lighting to be with the fewest number of chips and the easiest uh, controllable system to make an actual uh, sunlight inside. And there are some tremendous advantages to this. We can get CRI very, very close to uh, 100%, which is the goal of uh, any of these indices, usually 100%. And so much so that when you use these type of lights for photographic work, there's little or no post-production editing because the, uh, the colors are rendered so accurately. And you can see on the right side, just by comparing one apple over various ranges of CRI, the apple that is photographed in the least CRI scenario is, is really quite not an appealing piece of fruit. But if you bring it into light that's full spectrum and extremely well adjusted for CRI, which perfect light is, you get the apple you would like to eat, which is you know an advantage to somebody trying to pick out fruit, I suppose. We've taken perfect light across a great many study groups in order to you know prove its efficacy. We've been looking at how it can help people with uh, Alzheimer's. We've also teamed up with some workers who study people who work shifts and who have the unenviable difficulty of having to change their weekly circadian entrainment as they uh, progress through their work week. And this turns out this is quite difficult for people, even in so much as causing more accidents for people who have to work on shift work and, and other uh, disease predispositions are also seen in these populations of individuals. We've also started with inpatient psychiatric uh, activities. So the circadian entrainment is thought of as something that can help those who are needing inpatient psychiatric work. And this will be investigated by researchers. And then we work with national labs to do uh, characterization of biodynamic lighting and in controls. And we also work with the centers that do the studies for the aged. In general, the, the reception is quite good to anything that would help any of these populations, these vulnerable populations. Who, who need some way of seeing their interior environments better suited to their, their lives. So very broadly put, perfect light mimics sunlight, and this is a significant benefit to circadian entrainment. There's a new figure of merit, actually, that's been created for this. A little bit mathematical here, but uh, the M over P ratio. You can think of this as the light that keeps us alert divided by the energy of the light that is useful for vision. The M over P ratio is the potential for the light source to produce light for a, let's call it the daytime detailed vision, the photopic vision, 
relative to that which is uh, actually there to cause us to be awake or alert. And these are two different measurements. One is talking about the rods and the cones. The other is the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. But this is thought of as a way to now characterize light that takes into account both. So when we calculate the M over P ratios for perfect light, what we find is it's extremely well aligned with what sunlight is or what an incandescent bulb is at one end of the spectrum. So we feel as though these are ways in which we can show that the lighting does, in fact, give us, you know, figures of merit that should allow other individuals who are working under this light to have good circadian entrainment. Circadian design is a little more complicated than just looking at these factors. Architects and lighting designers can follow something called the well building standard, which gives it other aspects of how to set up the building so that lighting can be used effectively. But this uh, equivalent melanopic lux, which is essentially the, this M over P ratio then multiplied by the overall lux, is thought of as now an important standard, an important new value to look at when any building is being designed. And this is being aided by things like the well building standard, the IAS committees that work on this type of topic so that the whole community of lighting can understand this topic better and build better lighting system. There's an example here of, you know, what are we going to do with work areas? You know, the vertical plane is literally right at you with a laptop or even a monitor. And so we have certain things that have to be accounted for. And there's beginning to be a body of knowledge that shows us how to measure because the light that influences our circadian rhythms has to be delivered into the eye. It cannot be sort of just surrounding you or bouncing off the top of your head or being occluded by your eyebrows. So it's this, what's known as the vertical illumination is the critical parameter that has to be considered. And uh, this too is beginning to enter the design procedures that are, that are being done for new buildings. And there are even modifications being made to existing buildings to improve these factors for uh, occupants. And the goal is to restore the circadian rhythm that is lost by uh, mostly inferior uh, monochromatic interior light so that we can you know, wake fully rested and concentrate uh, easily throughout the day and then fall asleep easily in the evening. Essentially, this is syncing the body's clock, giving us the improved, call it, way to live through having better light systems available to us. We are, as a company, producing a wide plurality of fixtures that have perfect light in them. Here's a few examples, and we also are able to install this type of lighting via retrofit, which is a process whereby we take another light fixture that perhaps somebody's wanting to have in their, in their design motif or something, and we just put perfect light into it. And this, is, uh, this proves to be a fairly successful way to meet all the needs of the architects and the designers of these buildings. So we have standard products, and then we also have uh, retrofit kits. Complementing this technology is a series of controls. We set out at the beginning realizing that people were going to want to incorporate this technology, but it had to be easy to use. If it were too difficult to use or deviated too much from how standard light fixtures are used, uh, it probably was going to meet with some resistance. So we have electronics, which include the memory and control functions. We even have rather standard looking sliders that give you dim and, and CCT control and on off. And we have uh, apps for changing the setups and uh, controlling the devices real time. And we've even put those apps through to being controlled via voice commands, for example, within Alexa. So we have a full gamut of controls and app technology that allows us to customize, improve, update, and uh, give the clients uh, exactly what they need out of these setups. For example, there's a button on the perfect control called My Perfect Day, which is a way of setting up your exacting sleep schedule throughout the day. And it's proved to be very, very successful for the way the technology is getting deployed. But this is the basic kit that one needs, the products, and then these control schemes. Uh, we also uh, maintain a system that, as you can see it tuning here um, online so that people can do a simulation without ever leaving their computer uh, workstation and see what a, a typical uh, area they might work in. Here you see pictured uh, hospital workers uh, going through an average day. And uh, throughout the day, they're, they're experiencing sunlight coming through windows, but the light that's over their heads is also changing. Meanwhile, it replicates uh, sunlight in, in, throughout the day and, and can be changed as to its location on the planet and also the, the type of setting. Uh, for instance, education, hospitality, office, retail, 
healthcare, grocery, and residential are all, all considered. Thank you very much.